There was one very talented developer. He revealed in a conversation that we were having this feature he was working on. And I remember thinking, damn, that is a great idea. Justin Fairman is the founder and former CEO of LearnDash, one of the leading solutions in the LMS space. I went back to our team. We need to prioritize this idea. We did, we put it out and we got all the kudos. And like a year later, he shut down that whole product. Justin sold the company with 76% profit margins. That is an example of being competitive. Just maybe mm. talk less and listen more. In this episode, we're going to dive into the strategies and tactics that he used to take on bigger competitors with more resources and still come out on top. I was coming out with updates every two weeks because I wanted to constantly be in the inbox wow. of the people and tell people wow. like, look what we're doing, look what we're doing. People were like, wow, they're really making moves. I'm gonna choose them. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Plugin.fm. My name is Patrick Rollins, and today I'm going to be talking with a non-technical founder who tackles business with a competitive streak that's seen him go from underdog to top dog in the e-learning industry. He's since taken on the mantle of elite business coach at his company, Bright Growth, where he nurtures and guides the star entrepreneurs of the future. It's the combination of savvy business instincts, constant content creation, and confident competitiveness that's led to his success. Welcome, Justin, and thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Patrick. Yeah, thanks for joining us. I think lots of people uh, in the e-learning space, and I'm I'm kind of in that space, have heard of Learn Dash. So I'm really excited mm-hmm. to get into the details today. Um, so let let's start with Learn Dash and how much it grew recently. So especially in the pandemic era, it I'm assuming it grew like exponentially and just kind of skyrocketed up. Mm-hmm. And you sold. So for people who are just listening to the podcast, I imagine it was fairly steady growth. And then sort of, you know, pandemic made it go up in a parabola, like exponential curve, and you sold it there, right? Like in the middle of an exponential curve. What was, uh, what was that like? (laughs) It was a wild ride for sure. There were several points in the company's history where there was big jumps in growth. And Mm -hmm. obviously the pandemic was probably the biggest one. Now in 2020 March, that's when like the first lockdown occurred. And that's when the biggest first bump, March, April of 2020 came. Uh, Within two months, uh, six to eight weeks, I hired about 15 people uh, to come in, support developers. Um, It was was crazy. Uh, Wow. In six to eight weeks, you hired 15 people? Yes. Wow, that's a lot. Yeah. And I don't know. I mean, sometimes um, it's hard to remember pain. But like, if you Mm. think back during that time, we had so many support requests coming in. It was just we couldn't keep up at the time. Yeah. Um, and I always ran the ship lean and mean beforehand. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, we we're already having to catch up a little bit, but that was, uh, you know, we onboarded a lot of folks and then for the couple of years there, we're servicing them. And as everybody was creating online courses at that time and, and trying to either offer them, sell them, yep. you know, augment their offerings in some way in order to remain relevant during these lockdown periods. Yeah. So I've been in the e-commerce space and I've been in the membership space and I imagine e-learning and so, so I, sh- I should say I've sold those to customers, whereas e-learning I've done myself and I haven't sold that software to anyone else. Mm-hmm. So, but I, and I've seen the growth of e-commerce and membership software in the pandemic and it was bonkers. I think e-learning is probably even more bonkers because there's even fewer barriers to entry, whereas e-commerce, you need to have physical goods. Membership, you need to deliver something monthly. Yeah. E-learning is just, I, anyone in the world can make one course. Yeah. So your, your, your total addressable market was huge. Yeah, exactly. I mean, think about fitness professionals at the time. Uh, they couldn't offer anything wow, in right. person. And so they all wanted to create their own online programs. Now it's pretty normal. In fact, I personally, yeah. uh, I think I enjoy at home workouts now because of the pandemic, uh-huh. just being at home, working out, watching something uh-huh. on the computer. But yeah, it was almost every industry jumped at an opportunity for online courses. Wow. So, okay. So let's talk about e-learning um, as an industry. Why would you jump into e-learning? Especially because I, at least in the WordPress world, lots of people have already created e-learning solutions. There were, there were competitors around before you got started. Why did you think there was like a good, that was a good niche to, to pursue? So at the, at the time of LearnDash, Woo Themes was talking yeah. about, so I started in March, 2012, blogging about WordPress LMS. Yep. And what that would entail. I didn't know if I was going to build it or I should say find someone to build it since I don't know how to code. But I, I just started talking about it because I was an e-learning consultant. That's what I did mm. uh, in my day to day. Okay. I was in a conversation at a client site. We were talking about what LMS they were going to use. I mean, it's a huge billion dollar corporation. 
But the concept of an open source LMS came up at the time and still today, Moodle is one of those mm -hmm. LMSs that's open source. Mm -hmm. I obviously had a hobby in WordPress. I was like, man, I, I bet you that'd be a great LMS. You know, it's open source. It can augment with the training program as, as it gets bigger. You can add things for the students or the learners to make it more engaging. So that whole idea started based on my day job. Hmm. Yep. I started blogging and building an email list, decided to get it built. Now in October is when I started getting it built of that same year. And, and what year is this? 2012. Oh, 2012. Okay, yep. great. Oh, and this is pretty early. Yeah, yeah. And at the time, WooThemes said they were still kicking out themes and they had mm -hmm. this, they were calling it like a, a course theme. Mm -hmm. And at some point, as I was building or having somebody build LearnDash, they pivoted to a plugin and they were like, oh, we're going to make it a plugin now. And I was honestly, I was really freaked out. I, I didn't know. I was like, man, maybe I should pull the plug on this. I, I'm not sure they're huge. But then at the same time, I was like, well, that kind of validates it. And they mm. weren't calling it an LMS or anything like those words that I were I was using because that was my industry. And so there was at the other time, I think it was WP Courseware you might be thinking of, but they were kind of around um, doing mm -hmm. something, but they were calling it something different. I don't remember at this time. Okay. I was the only one calling it LMS, LMS, WordPress LMS. That was actually, I was targeting that, that uh, keyword in Google and everything. And, smart. and then January of 2013, mm -hmm. Sensei launched because they had all yep. those developers and resources. And I kind of hurried my launch to be a week right after. Um, and so from there, it was, you know, Sensei, Learn Dash, think WP Course, where some other okay. players came in. Um, I did that. I worked that and my job for four months. And then in April 2013, I left my job to do Learn Dash full time. Wow. Only four months. That was all the overlap you needed. needed. Yeah, that was that was pretty surprising. It was the the launch was great in my mind. Um, it wasn't like uh -huh. some spectacular launch, but you know, I made decent money and then I just reinvested it all to the developer I was contracting. It was like, hey, fix yeah. everything that's broken. Yeah. There was a dip in February. And then when the market realized, like, hey, this is cool, then the sales went up. And then I was kind of stretched too thin. I was, wasn't doing my day job very well. I wasn't uh -huh. doing the Learn Dash stuff very well. So mm. that's when I took the the plunge into uh, into Learn Dash and never looked back. So it was wild. So from idea to leaving, it was like a year. Okay, that actually feels pretty fat. And you, so from the context, have you done a bunch of other plugins or software companies or anything like mm -hmm. that, or was this kind of your first dip into that? In entrepreneurship, I tried many things for about a decade, okay. <laughs> but okay. uh, this was my first foray in the software. Okay. It was intimidating because I didn't, I didn't know what I didn't know. I was pretty naive. I mean, I can speak the language now. I know a lot more about WordPress development um, for an average person, but at the time I didn't know anything. Um, and and yeah. that hurt the company in, in the early years until, you know, things kind of smoothed out and I got people in place that were experts in there yeah. to like really freshen up the code and make sure everything was legit. Oh, nice. So it's interesting because I'm on the other side of this. I think I was working at WooThemes at the time. Now I worked on WooCommerce and not on Sensei, but it's funny because I know the I, I, I know the people who worked on Sensei and the, and the discussions that they had. So it's, it's cool to hear the other side here. L let me ask you, in a, in a theoretical magical world where they launched six months ahead of you, would that have like changed anything? You know, where it, it like if they if it felt like they had more of a lead, would that have changed anything? Probably. I think uh -huh. if I'm honest, I, I think at the time, like I was, you know, obviously I was doing my day job. I had this, I would work in the hotel rooms at night, uh, blogging, trying to build a buzz. I don't think I would have been able to build as big of a buzz because at the time there was nothing really out there. But if mm -hmm. Sensei was out and they were out six months earlier, mm -hmm. you know, maybe, maybe, but it was just mm -hmm. sort of a different approach. I was excited because yeah. this, I felt like I was bringing something that didn't exist quite yet. I mean, we're talking the early days. So one thing that LearnDash did that Sensei didn't do initially, then they obviously updated pretty quick, was you could mark things complete and have like a tracker and it would yeah. bring you to the next lesson like that. Yeah. Now that's like common. Yeah. yeah like that's like the most basic the features, right? But at the yeah. time that was unheard of. Like there was the yeah. membership industry and what LearnDash did and the others that entered is we connected the dots. It's like, why are you creating a membership to sell a course usually? And so we just took it that next step further that added just that cool factor that uh, mm -hmm. people were looking for, like making it easier for them to connect their lessons instead of creating pages and like manually yeah. adding links to each uh, following lesson. When you're comparing and contrasting yourself against competitors, you can and should highlight just about anything. 
but there are three things that Justin shares that you shouldn't highlight. More on that later. Let me let me take a side tangent here into competition because we were yeah. talking about Sensei and Wu themes. So I think you've preached on Twitter that people in WordPress might be too soft when it comes to competing directly head to head. Why do you think that? Why do you think that mindset is detrimental or could cause issues? Yeah, there's no single path to a destination. I'll admit that uh, my way of thinking in business is in everybody's way. Uh, I certainly believe in my way because I didn't invent it. I just emulated mm -hmm. what other mm -hmm. very successful companies have done. I tend to be a very competitive person um, just mm -hmm. in, I guess, in life, but healthy. Mm -hmm. You know, I've always respected competition. I, I don't get hung up on it. Um, too much. And certainly as I've gotten older, that's, you know, losses became easier to take and it's perspective. But in WordPress, especially in the early days, but still happens today, there is this mentality of like, uh, build it and they will come or doing something good yeah. for the community. This is great. Yeah. Like we don't pay attention to our competition. And I think that's silly because your, your customers are paying attention to the competition. They're comparing mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. to the other options. So whether you are or not, doesn't matter. It's not about you. It's about the customer. So if you want to speak the customer's language, you have mm. to compete. You have to relentlessly watch the people in your space, maybe the ones mm. that you consider are slightly above you, the ones that are right on your heels, and mm. make sure that you're always positioning yourself to be in the best light compared to them when somebody's shopping you or someone else. I mean, that's how you make more money. That's how you convince people yep. to buy your product. I'm so I'm a huge fan of positioning. I I, I really understand. I, I really believe that if you have a unique position in the market, you will always find customers. Like if you are the the best at security or whatever, mm -hmm. like you you will always have some amount of customers if you're the best at something with your with your position. I do have some reservations about comparing myself. Doesn't I think my here's my concern: if I spend all my time thinking about how I compare to competitor A, B, and C, I'm not thinking about how can I be the best product? Like, I, I think I'm only, I'm only contrasting. And sometimes it, it takes you to, instead of zero to one thinking, it's one to two thinking. It, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it, or it's incremental. It's like, how do I beat them by 0.1 seconds in load time, as opposed to how do I rethink mm -hmm. how we do design this? So that's not even an issue anymore. Does that make sense? It does make sense. And you're, you're absolutely right, Patrick. Like you can get down a rabbit hole and then suddenly you're okay. becoming reactive to the market. Okay. You don't want to react to your competition. I think what I always did is I would look at the competition was doing from a feature standpoint, from their value proposition to get an idea of how they're going after the market and then seeing how we compared to their value proposition. And if it was possible to nullify an advantage they had in that way, or to maybe call out what we did and why that was more important than some of these other value propositions that were out mm. there. Right. And convince people of, of our way um, and why we believe oh, cool. our way is the best. Okay. I love that. I, and I, I think I would separate, I think, and I don't think enough companies do this. There's product strategy and that should probably be, that should be something you own and figure out of like, what, what is, how do we build the best product for customers period? Yeah. And then maybe once you launch that, mm -hmm. then there's maybe marketing positioning, yep. uh, which is, then I think that's a little bit more reactive and you can, Oh, they have this one point. It's actually not that important. Let's write a blog post about mm -hmm. yeah, why that's not the most important feature. Exactly. Okay. And, and But sometimes you do get in a feature battle. Um, it mm -hmm. happened a few times in the history of LearnDash where there was one up and coming competitor, huh? very talented developer. Um, I still like the individual. We're still kind of friends. But he revealed in a conversation that we were having, I was with some other people, this feature he was working on um, in the WordPress setting. This is another part about being competitive. I never revealed too much about what we were working on, what was coming amongst the community, because maybe it, it was, you call it paranoia, call it just trying to keep a competitive advantage. But this individual did. And I remember mm -hmm. thinking, damn, that is a great idea. And <laughs> I, I was like kicking myself. I didn't think about yeah. it. Mm -hmm. I went back to our team, to the developer. I brought it up. I said, we need to prioritize this idea. If he gets it out and starts making a splash, like people are going to see that and start going to that product. Um, and I'm trying to you know, maintain our position. We did. We put it out and we got all the kudos. We got all the kudos oh, in the wow. world for it. Yeah. And like a year later, he shut down that whole product. Wow. It, is that the reason? No, but like I, that there's probably other reasons there. But the fact oh. that we already had a leg up, we were already ahead of him. And then I came out with it and then we got all the praise. That is an example of being competitive. Just maybe mm. talk less and listen more. 
And you're gonna, you're always gonna have an advantage. Justin has a ton of great mental models. One of them is his Wendy strategy, which I had never heard of before, but it did make sense once he explained it. If you're a smaller business, you want to be the Wendy's to your competitors, McDonald's. Let's talk about, so I, I think for a while you were an underdog. I think eventually you kind of became the, the destination uh, LMS. Yeah. But I think for a while you're an underdog and, and yep. you know, Woo Themes, which is at the time uh, a giant. Juggernaut. Uh, in the, yeah. A, a juggernaut is, yeah, in the in the WordPress world, comes out with a d- directly competing product and they launched a week before you. That's, that's scary. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How do newcomers with fewer resources shine how do you how do you how do you outplay bigger players great question and i think it can be separated into strategy and tactics tactics will always change with the times i the tactics i used might not work for somebody today but the strategy is the same so my mentality with woo themes at the time is they had a portfolio of companies or a portfolio of products I didn't need to beat Woo Themes at being Woo Themes. I needed it to be Sensei, just that uh, product. Uh. And so my philosophy at the time, I used to say, I want to be the Wendy's to their McDonald's. And so for anybody that's not in the United States, Wendy's is another fast food chain. And their strategy in the 80s was to build a building right across the street from McDonald's all the time. So if people were stopping at McDonald's- Is that true? It is true. Yeah. What? That was, I didn't know this. So that's why whenever you go and you find a McDonald's, there's usually a Wendy's that's right across the street. But, I didn't know that. So that was my philosophy in, initially. So whenever there was an article written about Sensei, whenever if, if I couldn't get in the article, I was in the comments. If there was uh, uh, forums or any conversation, if there were podcasts or whatever, I, I was always reaching out and networking with folks that were maybe gravitating towards Sensei or talked about Sensei in any kind of way. When Sensei, or I'm sorry, when Woo Themes got bought out, they kind of shifted the attention strictly to WooCommerce. And that was, boom, opportunity. We kept hitting the pavement with e learning, they took their foot off the pedal. And they never got back. Actually, a couple of years after the acquisition, I didn't even consider them a competitor. Um, I know Ronnie over there that's running it now. Ronnie is awesome guy, and they're trying to revigorate in some ways. Um, but at the time, like they just lost too much ground because of the focus on WooCommerce, and they've done amazing things in WooCommerce, and that's mm-hmm. probably the right play. Mm-hmm. But just sticking with that mantra, I only need to beat them on this one product. I only need to beat them. Mm. Everything I did. All my team's energy was for one goal in the space where their team's energy naturally was spread out over products and offerings and customers. So for somebody to bring it back up to today, somebody that's trying to get into a space that's already crowded, the first thing is market research, looking and seeing what people are saying, what they're complaining about. And Mm -hmm. you don't have to create a competing product on every feature level. A lot of the products out there are very feature rich, but like that can be to their disadvantage. There are certain features that are more used than others. And can you slim it down? And then can you contextualize that in your sales copy and in interviews you do, YouTube channel, creating content? I mean, if you're not creating content, what are you doing? Uh, you have to do something. You can pay for ads mm-hmm. and I've done that too. But you need to put yourself out there because these bigger companies, like in my opinion, Woo Themes was kind of like a big uh, cruise ship and I was mm-hmm. a speedboat. So I could turn yes. really quick they had the momentum and they were big and they had the following, but I was you know, right in the waters next to them. Yep. People that are starting out, you're the speedboat. You can create a lot of noise. Uh, I was co- at the time coming out with updates every two weeks, rigorous schedule, because mm. I wanted to constantly be in the inbox wow. of the people that were wow. looking at LearnDash versus Sensei. Sensei wasn't because they had more QA, probably more processes. It was probably for the good. But I was constantly, I was on my developer, like we need to get something out, we need to get something out. So I can email and tell people like, look what we're doing, look what we're doing. And that resonated. People were like, wow, they're really making moves. I'm going to choose them. Uh, yep. My approach to the market was I was an e-learning expert since I was a, a, a WordPress development thing. You know, it wasn't, yeah. I'm the expert. But if you want to go with the generic thing, you can go with them. But if you want to go with the expert, then come to me. Hmm. Fantastic. So there's a, okay, there's a, a lot there in that answer. There's strategies and tactics. There was Wendy's, the Wendy's approach to McDonald's. <laughs> there was, you only need to beat them at your one product. I actually, I actually don't know what to take away from that. And maybe that's a good, there's a lot of, a lot of individual lessons there. I, I, okay. So I, don't, I, may, I probably forgot to, to list one of those. What is the most important 
um, one. I, I have my own inclination of which is the most important of the ones you just listed, but like what, you know, you're, uh, what is the, what is the quintessential thing that you, um, lens? What blends to, it, what connects yeah. them, I think, is just relentless communication of your message and your value. I think we see a lot of people that are starting out, maybe they're doing build in public. And I think that's one reason build in public works, by the way, is because mm-hmm. it forces you to be kind of relentless, keeping people in the know, communicating, communicating, communicating. That's what I did. Anytime I could create a, a blog post, take a pot shot when I could about something. Anytime I was on a podcast, I would write, I blogged every day for a year, every day. And so if you look at the Learn Dash blog, there's some old posts, but I was blogging every single day when they weren't. Mm-hmm. I was on every single comment section at the time on blogs that were talking. Things. I was over communicating and talking and shouting my value proposition from every corner. Yeah, I, I, uh, I, I hope this doesn't have a negative connotation because it's not supposed to. But flooding the field is kind of just what came up to my mind. Just like you can't. May, so maybe the way to think about it, you can't research that market without coming across Learn Dash. Hundred percent. And right now yeah. it was, it, and they would be in the conversation now. It was now it's like number one often. It's, yeah. Sometimes it's the only um, WordPress solution. This is where uh, strategy came into play. I was from the e-learning space. I had e-learning connections. So mm-hmm. I had LearnDash listed on an LMS list that didn't even include WordPress, took that nice. and then communicated, hey, everybody, we're the only LMS that is, that is WordPress that's listed on these things. We were included in e-learning magazine. That's by no accident because I had yeah. connections. And then I told people like, look, we're an e-learning magazine. You're not going to find any of these plugins on there, but we were because we're serious. This is the kind of stuff that I was always saying and, yeah. and, and flooding the market with that message. As yeah. you put it, I think it's a good way to say it. And maybe it was easier to me, for me to do it because I wasn't coding. I wasn't developing. Mm-hmm. So what was I doing? Mm-hmm. A lot of folks that are listening to this are super talented developers and creating really fantastic pieces of software. Yep. But in doing so or neglecting that other piece, that's an afterthought. Mm-hmm. It's like, okay, now I've developed this thing. I'm really proud of it. And you should be. Now I got to tell some people and they do a little bit, but it's not, it was flipped for me. I was doing yeah. no coding. So I was, I was doing some support because I was the yep. main product support guy. And I was just boom, 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 message all day long, every day. So I, there've been some interesting discussions, like many times, sorry, many times people are technical and they want to hire a marketing person. And when they do, you know, it's, it's like, what keywords do we use? And like the volume is incredibly slow. And it like, there's a lot, it takes a long time to get started. The volume is low. You'll get like one blog post a week Mm. and sometimes the quality is low. Yeah. So when you, you know, writing a blog post a day is pretty great. I, I will say to all the learners out there, I was very slow at writing blog posts. And then I did take a 30 day challenge where I wrote a blog post every day. And about a week in, I figured out how to write a blog post in a day. It took a, like, it was really, really hard the first week. It was, it felt impossible. Yeah. And then after a week of doing it, you're like, okay, this is, get the idea, get the outline, write the thing down, shoot it out, figure yeah. out featured images and images later. That was, that was my process. Yeah. But I, how do you, you know, if you're a technical person, how do you hire someone who can either A, learn that skill or B, already has it? Because I, I imagine hiring you to to do that would be expensive, you know. It is. Um, so first of all, for you to have any traction, and this could change too, because we know how Google is and all that, but mm-hmm. um, we didn't really mention it. I don't think we'll talk about it much, but I'm happy to, is I almost started an AI company, Gap Scout. Oh. I did it for about a year. I pulled the plug because of legality things, and uh-huh. we can talk about that. But I did the marketing again, and mm-hmm. I did a little bit of tweaking on what I did at LearnDash, but it still worked. You need three posts, minimum 1,400 words a day to create content spokes. And that means you have a theme. So my theme was market research for, for that. And then I had articles that all related to market research. I linked all those articles back to the market research pillar article and the pillar would link out to these spokes, you know, spoke articles. And I would do that across different, you know, I think like you, um, customer experience was another one, all these different keywords. And over time I started getting more and more people coming to the site and I have thousands of people signed up for this list on software I'm not even releasing, but, uh, mm-hmm. that, that worked. And I did experiment. I started with two blog posts because I used to do three at learn dash. I was like, I'm mm-hmm. only going to do two. By the way, I started writing them until I found somebody uh, to write for me. Mm -hmm. And that was good. It was getting traction, but I upped it to three and the Google Analytics, the metrics, everything shot up. So three posts, minimum 1400 words. Sometimes I went 2000, whatever. 
Um, and I eventually got two writers working on things. I had a good sense of SEO. Um, I, I didn't really want to go in the AI route of writing uh -huh. articles. Um, uh -huh. I think jury's still out if that's a good idea or not. But um, yeah, it still works. I think the point is it could be content like that, but it could be YouTube yeah. as well. YouTube yeah. is arguably, I'm coaching some folks now, they use YouTube um, yeah. for uh, these individuals outside the WordPress space. But he was talking to me, he's like, I don't even bother with content because YouTube's algorithm updates like once a year. And the mm. policies that they change are usually impacting like the income from ads, right? They're not yeah. impacting really the search as they huh. are in Google. And so huh. he's killing it um, just through YouTube videos, short little YouTube pieces. Yeah. So it's something to, to think about as well for folks that are creating content. Maybe it's a podcast. Um, yeah. You just have to be out there producing something. Yeah. So the, going I back to that. your question, though, I didn't answer it. How do you find yeah. somebody? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. That's a tough one. I've joined I've, the two writers that I found. One was um, introduced to me from a former writer I had. They all know each other. So if you know somebody, and even if you know that you probably won't be able to hire them, reach out to them. Maybe you get one article, but then you can say like, oh, is there someone else in your network? Um, mm -hmm. I also joined some um, Slack groups and I forget which, I'm not forgetting off the top of my head, but I can probably do some research. But I joined some Slack groups that were around like content marketing, business starting, and they had like a hiring section. I just kind of typed cool. in there. Some guy reached out to me. Um, he, he was excellent. Um, hmm. He's uh, So it's, it's a crapshoot. Sometimes you got to, I tried yeah. other ones and I just were like, no, nope, this isn't going to work. I tried some off of Upwork. Um, mm -hmm. People that have a good sense of just j solid SEO principles without trying to game yep. the system. Yeah. Is this, uh, is this the type of thing where you hire someone who's a fast writer and then they may know nothing about your industry and you just slowly <laughs> teach them about your industry and you know, they'll, they'll get technical details wrong of it's a SaaS software as a service, not a WordPress plug. You know, they'll, they'll get mm -hmm. those things wrong and that's okay. And it's, it's worth the, the trade off. Yeah. That's what I did. Um, especially in the second go around and then <clears throat> with learn dash, when I brought in the writer, she was familiar with WordPress, maybe not mm -hmm. developer, definitely not developer depth knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, but my articles were more like at that time about e-learning, online course creation, yeah. that kind of stuff. And then um, on the second business, like market research and those kind of things. So I think, you know, those it's easier to somebody to come up to speed. You want to find somebody that knows SEO. Like mm -hmm. in very simple SEO, just how to create articles, yeah. interlink them and, and target yeah. some keywords that are obtainable and, and the right at a good volume. Right. Well, I, I think we could talk about this all day, yeah. but I'll, I'll, I'll move on. But that's super, this is super interesting. I, I love, I love hearing this. Um, okay. So, <clears throat> so speaking of head to head marketing with your competitors, mm -hmm. I think before this interview, you highlighted the idea of identifying a competitor's core strengths and then going after those exact strengths in that head-on yeah. uh, head-on competition. Yeah. Can you share an example of that, um, like with with, with Learn Dash? Yeah, sure. Um, so Learn Dash was built on the blog, right? And uh -huh. as I've talking been talking about, that was the only marketing strategy I did for years. It's kind of crazy to think that Learn Dash didn't have a YouTube channel at one point, but mm -hmm. it didn't. It just didn't seem as important um, at the time. Lifter LMS they had a YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. Love those guys. Uh, Chris is a, a really great person. Um, the guy, Chris, who runs uh, Lifter, and, and I have tons of respect for them. Um, they had a YouTube channel. That was kind of their main customer driver. They were doing mm -hmm. interviews and podcasts, their LMS cast. And I realized that they had an advantage over us by having a presence there. So I went directly to the field that they were in. I was like, how do we outcompete them in YouTube? I'm going to create my own videos with a spin, leveraging my mm -hmm. expertise as somebody in e-learning. And so I started off mm -hmm. talking about instructional design principles, like the best mm -hmm. ways to create courses to maximize course completions, because in the e-learning world, the course completion is a conversion. Yeah. So how to maximize that, how to structure your courses. Oh, by the way, is how you do it at LearnDash. And those were the types of videos and then started creating videos about, you know, learn dash with gravity forms, learn dash with Elementor to kind of piggyback on these popular, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. platforms. And I, I hesitate to say what their, um, subscriber count was, but learn dash ended up just being way ahead of it. It was mm -hmm. 12 or 13,000, something mm -hmm. like that when, when I was done and theirs was maybe less than half of that. Mm -hmm. They also had a Facebook group and we didn't have one. And by the time I was done, it, it was larger. It was 20 some odd thousand p 
people in the group versus mm-hmm. theirs that were a fraction of it. So I went to where they were and yeah. I wanted to have a bigger presence just for the social proof. It was, yeah. if, if it's a Facebook group, I just started in the media onboarding the emails that people got when they purchased. I'm like, you need to join the group. So I just started like really mm-hmm. bashing people over the head. The fact that we had a group, they should join, they should join mm-hmm. YouTube channel. And I was sharing the YouTube channel in the group. So I was cross pollinating the different areas mm-hmm. for getting more subscribers, um, running little contests if it made sense, but going directly to where they were at and knowing, okay, they're ahead of us right now, but I'm going to beat them. And here's mm-hmm. the strategy we're going to have. It's going to be methodical. And it, it took it took some time. You know, it took like yeah. two years really to, to really get ahead. Well, okay, so I'm a big fan of. I like that you're. You seem very. Uh, you seem very strategic, which I love. You're just like that's an advantage. I don't want them to have this advantage. We're going to counteract that advantage by doing this. At a certain point, you want to go cool. We got a YouTube channel. It's the 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 subscriber numbers are going up and to the right. We're on the right track. Mm-hmm. Now I want hand off this project to someone else because I can't do a YouTube video every week. Yeah, I, I guess maybe the question is, how do you know that something like that is even worth the money? Because eventually it's, I want to do this. I want to get it started. I want to make sure it's going in the right direction. And then I want to train someone on my team or hire someone who can do this for me because there's only 40 hours in the week or, or I guess there's more if you want to work more, but there's only so many hours in a week and I don't can't do everything myself. Yeah, I always did everything myself initially to get that gut check. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. Some of it is data driven, but not everything Mm -hmm. can be a secure data driven decision. I think I see a lot of folks get caught up on that. They're like, oh, I Mm -hmm. I need more data or I got to get the data before Mm -hmm. I know for sure. You're never going to know for sure. Mm -hmm. I think it was pretty easy to see that YouTube was driving um, interactions uh, and folks coming to us. I I coach somebody now and they do YouTube and they're in the WordPress space. And he's getting a 10% conversion from people that come from YouTube to his product compared to something that's lower when they're, when he's not, uh, when they're coming from like blog posts or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I did track a a little bit about how people were finding us and if they were finding us through YouTube, Mm -hmm. but I did see, uh, that like our, our visitors went up because of it. Mm. Um, because just being in the search, uh, back when YouTube videos were more prominent in search results and all that, like that helped out, um, Mm. And then Google, I'm sorry, YouTube being like the second biggest search engine in the world. I just, I just was like, how have I not done this? <laughs> yeah. Um, but to answer your question, it's data, but then intuition a little bit. For me, it was a social proof thing. I know when I saw YouTube channels that had a decent amount of subscribers, like as opposed mm-hmm. to like 50. Yeah. I, I was like, oh, okay, cool. And then yeah. videos with like thousands of views as opposed to like yeah. a couple dozen. Yeah. That resonates with me. And so I was creating something similar for people like me. And I was like, well, if I, yeah. Yeah, I'm sure other people do something similar, or if they see a Facebook group, they can join it, start talking to people before um, they purchase yeah. and get a feel for the community. And, the, and the, we fostered a good community there. It wasn't just people yeah. like complaining. I mean, there were some complaints about bugs or whatever, but mm-hmm. it was a social proof of being with tens of thousands of other people. Got it. Very cool. Okay, so one area that every business have has is a, or almost every online business has is some sort of blog or some sort of content marketing strategy. Mm-hmm. How do you compete in content marketing? Because it seems like, especially I'm thinking written word, that seems harder to compete in than like there is no Facebook group. I create a Facebook group. So how do you compete just in like a specific realm? Well, in the context of Learn Dash, um, I think it depends on your product. So mm-hmm. if you're an add-on for another product. I think content marketing becomes a little more challenging. Uh, LearnDash was a platform plugin, so it was easy to go after the industry. Um, you could still do that as an add-on, but I thought like, all right, how do I write going after an audience that would potentially use this? So somebody creating a course or in- design in- instructional design tips for creating a course with WordPress interweaved in there. Um, it was more about how to rank for e-learning than it was rank for WordPress. Mm -hmm. And then that's how a lot of people got their like first introduction to what we were doing. Um, So whenever possible, keyword wise, think about the industry you're in Mm. and see there's always low hanging fruit in something and go after those, those particular, those keywords. Now, another good strategy is the piggyback one where you just, you know, you're comparing yourself to another product that may be more popular than yours. And then you're always, you know, talking about it in the context of what they're doing. Um, I've seen that work to some degree for add-ons and stuff because then they interject their value proposition. But um, content marketing is hard. 
And I'm mm-hmm. not even an expert at it. That's why I always hired people that were better from mm-hmm. SEO. I went for a volume approach. I was like, I'm just going to talk about <laughs> e-learning and not pay attention to the keywords. And it worked at mm-hmm. the time um, in those early days. That became more important to be more intentional um, mm-hmm. with, you know, we used Yoast SEO. So we yep. always made sure that was uh, on point and just followed the, the, the guidelines there. Got it. So, okay. So I want to talk about a specific thing about if you were reading that a f- competitor has feature X and you don't have feature X and let's say, you know, you can't build it in a week, you know, there's no, there's no easy button where you can build it in a week and then talk about it in the next week. How do you compete with someone that maybe has an advantage in features? How do you, mm. how do you handle that? That's a great question. Um, and I'm afraid my answer is going to be not pointed or a little hazy. It is a gut check on some level. Like you have to remind yourself and any entrepreneurs if, that's making money and selling a product, you have some intuition. You have that skill, that ability to point out something in the market that you know people want. You have to evaluate that specific feature, one, against your whole vision for what you're bringing to the market and if it makes sense. And then also, if people are actually asking for it, I mean, people will be very vocal Mm -hmm. if you don't have it. So sometimes they make the decision Mm -hmm. easy. Um, There'd be features in the past that I was like, I'm not going to develop that. And then so many people were asking for it. It was like, dang, we kind of have to. So Mm -hmm. that made it easy. Other times, yeah, it was it was just me looking at something and be like, you know, I think based on what I know in the market and what people how people are using my product today, I think Mm -hmm. they would like this. I mean, a gut check. Yeah. I used to, so one of the things I used to always do is go look at people's public roadmaps. I'd be like, all right, what what do they consider important? And then they'd have like upvotes from their own customers. And I'd be like, ah, "Ah, okay. (laughs) You know, like when I was looking and doing my research, um, it's just like right there in front of you, what their audience thinks is important, which is probably similar to what your audience does. Smart. Is there, and I think you also read uh, review sites, right? Like third-party review yeah. sites and you'd, you'd scour those? Yeah. So that was something unique. Nowadays, you see every WordPress plugin on G2 or Captera, but LearnDash was one of the first. And I did it because there was no free version to be on the repo in the first place. But I wanted the, I wanted the perception of what LearnDash was doing to be on a different level, like an industry mm. expert and to be amongst other industry LMSs. And that worked really well. That's where we had a lot of the reviews. Um, I would look at reviews of L- other LMSs and like, and I'm thinking just things like Kajabi would be on there and they have an mm-hmm. LMS component, uh, Teachable. Those those are kind of what I consider the main, you know, thinkific competitors yeah. of LearnDash in the SaaS space. So I would look at the SaaSs and see what people liked and didn't like. And then I would use that to influence some of the advantages. For example, kept or teachable, one of the things that they always complained about was their quizzing. Their quizzing is it's still not very good. Mm-hmm. And I know from experience that people really value the quizzing in terms of how to evaluate uh, their their learners and if they know the content, especially if they're teaching something that requires like a CEU or something very credible. It has to be what is a CEU? Uh continuing education unit okay. or a profession. Um, got it. Healthcare is the one that always comes to mind for people, but there are mm-hmm infinite number of CEOs across industries. So they have to report different metrics right back to the state. And like, you can't use Teachable for that because they just lack that. So I saw that and we created a ton of stuff about creating certification courses for certain industries and Uh would ham up our our whole quizzing features and make sure that people knew about how much better our quizzing was than these other SaaS platforms. And in my mind, that was uh, an example of using those review sites to really call out and highlight an area that we were doing better. One of the things I like about Justin is that he can have two opposing thoughts in his head at the same time. When I asked him about paid ads, he said it went really well and really bad. And sophisticated marketers can see the stuff that goes well and double down on it while cutting out the things that go poorly. Stay tuned. Okay, so I, I want to change uh, a little bit of direction here and talk about acquiring customers. Did you try paid media, you know, paid ads, Google ads and stuff like that? How how did that work? Um, Really well and really bad. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. The really bad was Facebook. Uh, Okay. So like I said, I always started a project to see if like I could do it and then if it would be worthwhile pursuing. Maybe that hurt us in a bit because like I could not wrap my head around the whole Facebook ad platform and like maximizing that. But then the more I thought about it, this could have been a uh, premature 
conclusion was like, who's going to like look at a Facebook ad, click it and buy software. In my mind, that was less likely of a customer path than something else like a Google search. So I transitioned to Google slash YouTube for ads. I did an awareness campaign on YouTube because um, targeting WordPress videos, people just talking about WordPress. So I created using some free software platform or paid SaaS, but it was like, you know, 10 bucks a month. I created a 15 second commercial or pre-roll and bid on an awareness campaign of anybody with certain keywords. So a lot of WordPress stuff. That did really well. Like it, people would watch the full 15 seconds even after they could skip after after right. five. They would watch the whole thing, which is really cool. And my goal there was not like, oh, I want to drive a bunch of sales. It was an awareness top of mind thing. And in there, you bet I was putting the uh, credibility of like University of Michigan using Learn Dash and all these other mm. things that were going on, just like how we were in this elite air. Um, mm. So people had that like idea of the product, which is what I was always talking about. We're the best and we're the experts and, and we're that solution that mm. is with these major companies and, and universities. So that was the awareness campaign that did well, but it's hard to say mm -hmm. the conversion rate. What did what I did have conversion rate was on the Google search. I had to do it out of necessity. People started bidding on our brand name um, because people were searching for it. And so I was like, dang, I, I want to be at the top of the search results for our, for our name, but also it's more competitive now. I set it up and look, I am not an expert in, in this kind of stuff, like blogging, setting up ads. And there's people that are pros, but all I did was set up and like follow Google's recommendations. Like it was really cool. Like you'd set up your pages, your, your ads, sorry. And Google would give it scores. And I learned that if you get a seven out of 10 of their page score, their landing score, because they'll rate the page that you're sending people to based on the search, mm -hmm. you're going to be pushed up in the ranking. So you got to aim for at least a seven out of 10. I used to have 10 out of 10, nine out of 10, seven out of 10. If it was a six out of 10 after two weeks or whatever, I would cut that ad and I would try something else or even better, Google suggests like, hey, you should change this huh. based on like their whole AI though, because it, it benefits them for your ads that mm -hmm. show higher. Mm -hmm. I would just follow it. I would add keywords they told me to add. Another thing it is, I didn't have one big list of keywords. I like really siphoned them off so I could be specific mm -hmm. with my ad so that page score would go higher. Mm -hmm. And then I would look at the conversions and I got it down to, I made $10 for every $1 spent. Now there was a cap because my keyword list wasn't really huge. So it's not like I could just mm -hmm. maximize my profit or my spending and then maximize my return. But I mean, we're talking hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars made for the business just by doing these ads. Fen phenomenal. I, and I love that you said both really good and really bad. I think that that feels like a lot of entrepreneurship to me is <laughs> yeah. how'd that go? Really good and really bad, both. <laughs> yeah. um, really interesting. Sorry, we're, we're running late on time here. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut to the last two questions here. Um, okay. So did competitors ever use guerrilla marketing tactics against you? You know, once you became the, the, maybe the biggest player, did anyone use some of your same tactics against you? Yeah, for sure. Um, at, you know, in the beginning it was a life cycle, right? Learn dash was just the newbie and that was fun. Mm -hmm. And you're punching up, you know, that's always fun to right. punch up. But then at a certain point is at the top and we were like, you know, kicking down, you know, trying to keep people <laughs> out of the, going up. And uh, that's a different place to be. We became the cruise ship that was slower to turn and they were, mm -hmm pumping out features. They could look at what we were doing and modify it in a way that people were asking, like in our Facebook group, I noticed they would look and see what people were saying in our Facebook group and then come out with their solution that did what they were asking. So they did the same thing I was doing. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's all, it's all fair game. Mm -hmm. So they, I remember seeing some of that. I saw some negative stuff too that really irked me. Um, I, that was something I'm always big on respect. If you're going to compete, be respectful. I remember, and I'll share it because I don't want anybody to do this or feel tempted to. We had a security issue, like most WordPress products do at some point, and it got kind of blasted. You know, it got it got some publicity, and another company, um, they're still around. They saw that and they created a campaign about how they're more secure mm. and how they don't mm. have these issues and you got to be careful when using Learn Dash. I saw that and um, immediately lost all respect for what they were doing. And uh, it was frustrating because I would never do that. But like that's, I mean, call it guerrilla tactic or whatever. I, I can see like, how do we be nimble and take advantage of, of get, maybe getting some customers? I see that mm -hmm. entrepreneurs 
mindset, but, mm-hmm. um, that's like the dark side, right? You don't want to go there. Mm-hmm. Plus, you know, it goes around, comes around at some point. Yeah. They probably did yeah. have a security issue as well. So, uh, it happens, but yeah, people did use it against me and, um, yeah, that's just the way, the way the market. Yeah. Are there, are, okay, so are there issues that you shouldn't jump into? Are there, are there advantages you shouldn't take? Like as an example of security, like that's a, that's a good, if you've been in software long enough, every software has security problems. Mm, yeah. And it, and it doesn't make sense to blast someone for one, one thing. Are there other issues that you would try to avoid um, if you're the gorilla? Um, this is a gray area, but when people do price increases and saying, Hey, mm-hmm. come over to us, we're cheaper. Cause you're probably going to want to raise your prices at some time. Some so yep. I've seen people do that. That's like an instant gratification campaign. Mm. Um, I never did it, uh, for that reason, because I was like, what if we raise our prices and what if they go higher than what that person wants? Um, so that's a gray area. I think you need to be careful, uh, if you're going to do a campaign like that. And then something I never did, I see it. I don't think this is necessary gray. I think it's probably fine now, but at the time I never advertised the importers that we had. Like if somebody mm-hmm. was on a different platform, I never put it on the website that like, Hey, come on over from these people. We have an instant mm-hmm. importer. You won't lose anything. However, if they were like wrote us and they're like, Hey, I'm using this product. We're like, Oh, we have an importer. So we would tell people in private, but I never put that out okay. there publicly. I don't really feel negative about that. Mm-hmm. If people do do that. In my mind, I was like, only people that are not the top do that. Um, and that mm. was probably more true a number of years ago. Maybe now mm-hmm. it's a little bit less like that. Okay. Interesting. There are, so there aren't too many, I don't want to say red lines, but, but areas that you shouldn't. There aren't too many, just a couple obvious ones. Yeah, just think about if you have to be and have a conversation with the person mm-hmm. that runs that competitor. Yeah. I mean, all these businesses, um, whether it's one person or multiple, like it's just people like trying to do some cool stuff, um, mm-hmm. have fun and serve customers. So it's not all big, bad companies. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. All right. Last question here. Uh, looking back, what would you, would you do anything differently and what can other software engineers take from your journey? Good and bad. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't hire quick enough. I did a lot myself, um, for a long time. I think, um, this is twofold. One, there was experts that could have done it better than me. Um, I was experiencing success. It's only natural that we say, well, I got here because I did it. So I'm going to keep doing it. As a mm-hmm. founder, I did not get out of the day to day quick enough. And chances are you can get out sooner than you think of like little tasks. Like I was still doing support tickets for some reason and uh, you know, way down the line. And it benefited the business more for me to be rubbing elbows, talking with people and forming connections. Mm-hmm. And I did. And that did push the bottom line more. So mm-hmm hire yourself out of a job, you know, get mm-hmm. some people in there to do the other work. They'll do it better than you. I mean, that's all they're focused on. So they're going to do it better than you. Maybe there'd be things that you would do differently, but the the mental space that you get from not having to do it anymore yes. um, is going to make you more money, like hands down. Um, so that would be something like I didn't do, I didn't hire quick enough. Um, something I did do, I mean, just always be vigilant, always be looking at the market, sign up for your customer's newsletter or your competitor's newsletters. Like just always be in the know, even whether you do anything with that information or not, it benefits you to be an expert in your space. It will benefit your, your pre-sales folks and, and people that are answering tickets coming in. It's just, you need to be on top of it. Don't be in a silo developing, you know, and then occasionally popping your head out to tell somebody like, Hey, this is what I'm doing and, and only mm-hmm. doing it in a WordPress you yeah. know, group. Um, you, you want to put yourself out there in more ways. So. That would be my my other piece of advice. Awesome. Justin, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate all this. Well, thanks for having me. I love talking about this stuff. Um, I I really appreciate you uh, extending the invite. And where can people find your coaching website? Yeah, my coaching website is brightgrowth.com. You can also reach out to me on X, um, just by name, at Justin Fairman. Um, I'm happy to talk about any WordPress projects, or even if it's not WordPress, that's fine too. Even if you want to tap me on the shoulder and get my opinion on something, I love that kind of thing. Awesome. Thank you so much. And thanks to our listeners for tuning in. If you enjoyed Justin's interview, please hit like and subscribe so Plugin.fm can keep bringing you more value-driven, insight-laden episodes from experts to help you along with your entrepreneurial journey. Go ahead and share this episode on your social channels to get the word out so we can widen our nets and help others like you. If you're looking for early bird access, visit Plugin.fm's website, if you're not already on it, and click on the subscribe button to find out what's to come before anyone else. 
Plugin.fm is brought to you by Freemius, your all-in-one payment, subscription, and taxes platform for selling software, plugins, themes, and software as a service. If you're struggling to grow your software revenue, send a note to contact at freemius.com to get free advice from Freemius' monetization experts. My name is Patrick Rolland, and thanks for listening to Plugin.fm. Thank you.